Bill Alexander with Driven Oil. So Driven Oil was started by Joe Gibbs in 2000, and it was because of the oil changes. They were losing camshafts and all the cup cars and everything. So they brought in some chemists and extra experts from my industry to come in and help them. They ended up formulating oils just for the Gibbs program, and those are what became the original Driven by Joe Gibbs. So they were so good, they started selling them to people, and then other people started buying them, and eventually they, Joe Gibbs said, wait a second, <laughs> we're not in the oil business. We got to." So, and that's where Lake started. Lake works for Gibbs back then. You know, they, they kind of developed it up. And then Scooter Brothers, Ron Coleman, uh, bought Driven from Joe Gibbs. They owned Comp Cams at the time. So, kind of came in. It was a separate company, but, you know, it was run under the umbrella. Continued to grow, continued to grow, especially, obviously, through all the years of the cams and the zinc and everything else. Developing a break, you know, we like to say we were the guys that first developed breaking oil. We kind of started that whole trend, which is true. I, I wasn't there, but, you know, went, went, went. And then now, you know, with uh, Comp and Edelrock becoming the same thing, uh, we're still owned by Scoot Brothers around Coleman. We're 20 employees, I would say. Here's what I like about us is, like Robin, for example. Robin worked at Comp Cams. He ran the Spintron. He did testing with them. I'm the only one from the oil industry. I've been in the oil business since I was 18. I've worked at big oil companies and small oil companies. I'm a car guy at heart. I, my whole life I built and kind of raised cars. So when uh, I got the opportunity to come and do this three years ago, it was like, okay, dream job fulfilled. So I jumped ship and, and moved to Driven. So the first thing that I think you should know about Driven is we do not make API oils or off-the-shelf oils. Does everybody kind of know what that is? Okay. We only make racing oils. Our oils are all high in zinc, or higher zinc levels than API oils. They're fortified with molly. We use some pretty exotic synthetic base oils. We use some pretty non-exotic base oils like our GP1, which is a straight mineral grade that comes out of a 130-year-old refinery in Bradford, Pennsylvania, which is the only place you can get it. Why? Because everything we do has an application behind it, and it's all high performance. So, that's one of the first things that people kind of will always ask is, oh, do you have a, you know, an oil for my daily, you know, my Hyundai or whatever? And it's like, no, we don't. You know, we only have oils for racing, whether that be drag and drive, whether that be drag, whether that be pro stock, off-road, you know, that's what we do. So I always like people to know that. Oil is simply base oil. It can be synthetic. It can be a blend of synthetic and mineral, or it can be you know, blended all different kinds of ways, but it starts with base oil, and then we just put additives in it. And the level and type of additive you use is how we formulate an oil for a certain application. So it's really pretty simple. One of the most important things, forget about our brand, forget about any brand, one of the things I think people have a lot of trouble with is the concept of viscosity. A lot of times people know or think they know what it means. <laughs> and that's why I'm kind of opening with it today, because. It's probably, viscosity questions are some of the biggest questions we get. What, there's a lot of people out there that are under the misconception conceptions are that a 5W30 means that when it's cold, it flows like a 5. And when it's hot, it flows like a 30. Okay? One of the things I wanted to point out, and well, before I do that, let's go back to you. There's two basic types. There's monograids, meaning it's a 70 weight nitromethane oil, and it's always a 70 weight. Okay. Now, as it gets cold, it gets thicker, and as it gets hot, it gets thinner, but it is not a multi-grade oil. It is a straight grade, and straight grades have some advantages out there. Um, straight grade oils, well, if you go back to the original days of motor oil, that's all you had, and old guys like me probably, well, I don't even remember, but, you know, in the, when it was hot outside, you know, you ran like a 50 weight, and in the wintertime, you ran like a 30 weight, right? And you did that so your car would start because a monograde oil isn't going to move. It's not going to change. It's just going to be what it is. So it's going to get thick when it's cold, or thick when it's cold and thin when it's hot. So monograde oils are kind of where we start. What we ended up doing was started using something called a polymer, which is basically rubber that we grind up and put into the oil. 
and it expands and contracts with heat and temperature. So now instead of having to switch from a 10 to a 30, you know, every season, you could what was now called an all-season motor oil, 10W30, 5W20, whatever you want to call it. So polymers are how that works. Okay, and the thing about polymers, remember, is anytime you have a multi-grade oil, you have polymer in there. So what they do, and this is the other thing that people sometimes, I like to tell people, is a multi-grade oil, they'll say, well, it gets thicker when it gets hot, okay? But really what it does is it resists flow. Viscosity, by definition, is an oil's resistance to flow. So, you know, you could figure if you had a 10-weight oil and a 50-weight oil, and you, you know, dump them on like a, a ramp, like a, a glass ramp, okay? The 50-weight is going to flow slower because it's got more resistance than the 10, okay? But when you put a polymer in a multigrade, a monograde to make it a multigrade, that polymer expands and tracks, and there's a little picture on there. See how it's kind of small when it's cold and big when it's hot? What it does is it expands out, and it makes that 20, say it was a 20-weight oil, it'll expand out, and it slows the molecules down so it flows slower. Does that make sense? It increases its resistance to flow. So it doesn't necessarily get thicker. It, that's the best way to say it, and that's the easiest way to say it. But what it does is it slows down its resistance to flow. So it's important to keep this stuff in mind because valve that is based on temperature, right? So let's go back to a 10W, well, let's just call it a 5W30, okay? We always measure that at 212 degrees after the 30 part. Okay, so if it's a 50 weight to 30 weight, a monograde 70, it doesn't matter, it's measured at 212 degrees F. Okay, has to be, because everybody in the world has to measure it at the same temperature. The important thing to remember is certain kinds of racing, they go way over that, right? Road racing and stuff, 300 degrees. NASCAR, but drag racers, do they get to 212 when they make a run? So that motor, remember that viscosity is adjusting based on temperature. So sometimes it's really important to keep that in mind. And the other thing, like I say, is we'll have guys going, well, I'm a drag racer, my oil doesn't get hot, so I'm going to run a 5W. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. So if we go to the next page, the 5W30, which I have an example here, the 5W is me measured in a test called cold crank. Okay? So if you look at this, this machine, this lab equipment we use, see how there's a little oil sample down there? There's a little thing that comes down and spins that sample at say negative 30 degrees and it measures kind of the torque, right, if you think of it that way, and it gives them a value that you assign to it and that's a 5W. But if you look at this other machine over here where we get 30, that's a capillary tube. So you're going to put the oil in there, you're going to heat it up to 212 degrees F, you're going to get a stopwatch, you're going to measure its flow. So when, people, when you look at 5W30 or 10W30, the important thing I guess I'm trying to say there is those are two totally different tests to get those numbers. So that it doesn't correlate across. So we, a lot of people think a 530 is, gets cold, it flows like a 5 weight. 30, it flows like a 30 weight, right? It doesn't. They're totally two different tests. It, the 5 is a cranking test. Will the oil crank the engine over and will it start in the wintertime? So the 30 weight is measured, at, and it, it's like a totally different test. And the reason I've been going through that is I've been hearing that lately when I've been out at events or talking to people, and they're talking about, you know, what viscosity oil should I run, you know, as far as drag racing or drag and drive, because that gets totally different, right? Like when we go on sick week, those guys have to run a different pace than they would just if they were just bracket racing. So a lot of them kind of think by using an oil like this, where they've got that movement that their oil's really changing dramatically in the mist and it's not. Does that make sense? First time I explained it that way. So that was kind of one of my new things I was doing, is um, trying to make sure everybody really kind of understood that. You know, because like I said, your, your viscosity, and, and you know, why do we talk about viscosity when we talk about racing? Well, if your oil, you know, is heavier, 
you're going to have more resistance on your rotating assembly, right? And so to free up power, people want to use thinner oils. And I've been doing a lot of testing on that, and I have a theory on it. There is horsepower to be gained with thinner oils, especially if that's the only application or the only thing you're really looking at. But don't go too thin because then you start to lose some ring seal, and whatever horsepower you picked up, you probably just gave back, you know? So when we're out talking to kind of the average guys at these events, I always try to take a minute and explain the importance, especially on BBT too. Go too thin on a BBT, it might change, you know, change your time, whatever. But viscosity is really, really important. And man, sometimes you gotta experiment a little bit to see, you know, where you're at with it. So yeah, question. The polymers uh, for these uh, these blends, are there any downsides Absolutely. to lubrication and uh, mm -hmm. the durability of the oil when yep. you add the polymers? Absolutely, that's a great question. First of all, polymers aren't lubricants, oil is. So generally the wider the spread, like a 550, and that, that's something to keep in mind. So the wider you see that spread, 550, that means there's more polymer in it, right? Versus a 520. Okay. <clears throat> Polymer is great, but it mechanically shears. And there's a lot of talk about, I don't want to go totally in depth about, there's a couple types different shear, like literally the shearing of the oil in, in the bearing. I'm talking about mechanical shear. So when these polymers expand, you know, say they're like this, okay? And then they kind of spread out like they're supposed to, right? To kind of hold that the molecules back as you're going down that ramp, right? Hey, let's slow this down. Let's have more resistance to flow. When they're out like that, they can get cut up like rubber bands. And that's really kind of, think of them as rubber bands, right? Stretched out, going like this. When they're out like this, your rings are going to cut them and start to chop them up. It's mechanical shear. And it's going to happen. It happens in, you know, all throughout the engine. As you shear that polymer down, you lose the viscosity. So now it can't go up as high as it used to. You can literally shear a, you know, a 540 down to a 530 you know, depending on what you're doing, design, engines, everything else. Um, like I said, we're, we're the official motor oil to say magazine. And so we're doing a lot of dragon drive stuff this year. It's a big area for me. I'm doing a lot of testing in a lot of different kinds of cars. And one of the things that we're finding is shear is a big issue in drag drive. You know, there, some of these guys are losing viscosity because they're drag racing and they're driving and drag racing, you know, and some will change their oil halfway through some won't ever, you know, but so we've been testing all the different kinds of oils out there just to kind of see what we can find, but mechanical shear was an issue. So yes, that is the thing. Um, see, and there's an issue, the there, there's an application where a, where a, a non-malted soil would probably actually be a better choice. Yeah. Because there's no polymers, there's not going to be any difference. Right. They're going to end up with what they start with. Yeah. And it's they're, they're driving in pretty much an environment that's, you know, you really don't need a winter mix oil for dragon drive. No, I mean, well, and you know what? That's funny you mentioned that, because that's what we thought. And so was, we get there, and this was my first, I've done uh, drag week a couple times. This is my first sick week in Florida. It was freaking cold in the morning when we walked out. I mean, you could see your breath. And I had guys that were had GB1 in their bathtubs in the hotel room trying to warm it up for the start the car next morning. I'm like, guys, hold on, you're, you're going to be fine. I mean, you got to remember that 5W, 10W, we're measuring that like negative 35, negative 30. We're nowhere close, but yeah, you're right. I mean, um, and as we get more into the products, we're coming back to that. Just like, you know, you can buy a better cam or a better whatever, we can buy better polymers. So it, there's better different qualities, and it's a, called a KRL shear test. And so in the KRL shear test, and, and I always want to be careful when I do these. I don't want people to think I'm anti-API oil, because I'm not. They're some of the best oils we have ever made as an industry, right? The, you know, the modern Dexos and things like that. And for a daily, you're good. I mean, those are awesome, really good oils. If I wanted to make an API oil, I could use a polymer that has what we call an SSI or a shearing. That's like how, how well is it at resisting that mechanical shear, um, which is at, it's like 35 SSI. All I'll tell you is the lower the number, the better. So 35 is pretty good. And Driven's um, products that you would use, like our LS30, DT40, DT50, are those performance oils, we use an 8 SSI polymer in that. It's expensive. 
it's really expensive. And it's not a commodity product because, you know, the 35 SSI where they're blending millions of gallons of all the different, you know, off-the-shelf motor oils, that's what they all use because that's all they need to use and it's fine. We're using an 8 from 35. It like quadruples our cost. But what we give you is a much, much better shear stability in our oil. Now, when we talk about selecting oils, you've got to think about whether or not that has any advantage to you, though, because if you're drag racing, you're running boost of methanol, and you're changing your oil you know, once in a weekend, that shear stability probably doesn't do you much good. You're paying for something that you, know, you don't need, right? Or you're not even going to get a good chance to use. I had a question on your oil flow thing. You yeah. said the polymers just slow to flow down, but obviously we want our oil to flow good. Yeah. Well, obviously thicker flows slower than, than thinner, but what's the, is there negative effects of the polymers actually slowing the oil down as far as like drain back and like which, which part of the oil is, you know, actually going when you have that many polymers in there? Like are the polymers there or the oil there? Because obviously you said polymers are not so, lubricants. Think of, think, yeah, good question. When, when we do a blend, keep in mind that on a typical blend, it's only about 12% polymer. The rest is oil and other additives. So it's not like it's, you know, half or something like that. Talking about drain back, nobody throw anything at me, but I'm an old guy. I build the big block olds right now. I'm, 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 the, I'm me and the five other guys in the world, right? For any of you who doesn't know, that's an automobile that General Motors built back then. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm building a 500 cubic inch and I'm going to do a twin torque storm Olds motor, but in the Olds world, we have big trouble with drain back. In other words, all our oil goes up into the top, right? Stars are bearings. There's a lot of voodoo out there about it. We use all these different kinds of restrictors and everything. But drain back is something, and I love that you mentioned that because I actually talk to people where I'll say, hey, if drain back is an issue, I sometimes will, will recommend this it's synthetic. You know, maybe you don't need it, but it will flow better. And synthetics and minerals, we'll talk about the difference in this and how they do it, but there's no disadvantage to it as far as, you know, it being there as far as, you know, it's pretty nominal as far as the lubrication. And what you want is the pressure, right? Because if you're, you know, trying to get pressure and you're 212, 220 degrees, and you're over down here to 20 weight, you're not going to have it, right? So you need those polymers to slow it down. So as it goes through the, you know, the oiling surfaces and goes through everything, goes through the bearings, you get a little pressure. So that's why it's there. So it is needed, but keep in mind, um, it's like if I walked out here or whatever, I guess you guys do a lot of drag stuff. Yeah. But you probably have road race stuff. Yeah, we have some road stuff. We have yeah. some dirt cars. Yeah. So as we're just talking about polymer in those instances, where they're hitting 240 degrees, 230 degrees when they come off, you know, they need that this, right? They need that. So, um, so no, not really a disadvantage other than the shearing, you know. But like I said, um, we use, and you know, we get that question all the time, why is shearing so expensive? That's good to Your oil costs more. Well, we use a lot of pretty exotic raw materials. They just generally cost more on the market because we're trying to make a better oil. You know, so, um, yeah, so. So as far as that goes, just kind of going through viscosity. If, I, if you go to this next page, what I did is, this is a chart in the middle here that shows, this is the SAHJ300 viscosity chart. So if you did an oil analysis, and you got the results back, okay, and you were looking at, there's, it's gonna give you a this at 100 degrees C, which is 212 degrees F, you would look at it and let's just say it said, you know, it was a 10. Okay, so you would go to this chart here, kinematic viscosity, and you can see if, if the oil is between a 9.3 and 12.5, it is a 30 weight. So those are, and that is measured with this flow, with this hot bath of water that is always 212 degrees, that flow, that chart. And if you look at um, your 5W, that is at negative 30, that. So we get the oil down to negative 30, and then we measure how much resistance there is on it, and then assign it a value there. So, like I said, I just, kind of the whole point for that whole conversation was, five, it's not a 5W when it's cold and a 30 when it's hot. They're not even the same test. 
they're not even in the same realm. So always keep that in mind. Robin, on the measurement of the shear that you just explained, sir, I can understand why other manufacturers would not want you to see that number. So uh, on, on driven oil, is that information given on the bottle? It's not, and you know I'm going to tell you why? Because that isn't on the final blend of the oil itself. It's just on that polymer, that raw material. Okay. That's what's being tested, not its overall. Okay. So, and the problem is that if we put that out there, people wouldn't know what it meant. You know what I mean? But coming here and telling you, I mean, I'm, like I said, I do our formulas. Lake did them before me. Um, you know, we use that polymer. And what that is, is for us, so when you blend in oil, I'm going to choose a base oil. I'm going to choose a ZDP package. I'm going to choose, you know, polymer. I'm going to choose all this stuff. We have tests that we use to let us know what the quality is or the performance is of those raw materials before we put them together. Then we test them and that's the stuff you see. You know, VI, you know, Visit, whatever. How many PPM is in? You know, that's the kind of stuff there. So yeah, good question, but it's something more we use. Okay. And sometimes, and a couple times in this presentation we'll talk about like, you know, somebody will say something about synthetic base oil. Well, yeah, that's fine, but that's what we use. And maybe there's not 100% of that base oil in that oil. So it can't have all the qualities that the base oil has just on its own. Thank you, sir. Yeah, no problem. I said, I love questions. It's easier for me to take questions than this stuff. So going back to it, the other thing on viscosity, and you guys know this probably better than I do, but why, how do you choose viscosity? Well, your old bearing clearance, right? Are you loose? Are you tight? When I build an engine, it's probably loose. God once told me if it's tight, everyone will know. If it's loose, you're the only one that'll know. I mean, I'm not as good as you guys at that stuff. Uh, <laughs> Takes me four years to build an engine for that reason. But what we have in this little chart here is comes with our stuff. We'll get you one of these. Oh, I actually brought them today. But when you do it, basically what you want to look at is your anticipated temperature. If it's a drag race car, you're probably not going to use, you know, over 220 oil tanks. It's a road race car, you will. So the first thing you want to know when you start figuring out what bits am I going to run in this thing? What am I going to, guys are coming go, well, should I use a 530? Should I use a whatever? Well, this is how you figure that out. And I'll kind of go through how I do it. So I always start with bearing clearance, okay? Depending on who your customer is, you may not know what his bearing clearances are, so you just kind of have to go with what they probably should do. Engine builders always know engine bearing clearances, which is what's good. So the first thing you go on is bearing clearance. Then figure what's the application. So if it's going to be road race, you're going to have high temperatures. If it's going to be drag, you're going to be lower. So you know you kind of got these three columns here based on temperature and your clearances. Now, one of the big things that we run into a lot with this, a lot of guys running boots and methanol now. And fuel dilution is something you've got to compensate for when, after you get to this point. So, interestingly enough, I didn't, we've recently figured out we have a big following in the import world. You know, like the Hondas and the Supras and all that stuff. And I actually went to my first import event this year. Like, I'd never been to one, right? Import drags. All those guys were on the boost, and a lot of it, and they all run methanol, okay? So when you're running methanol, you know you're gonna dilute that fuel a lot, so I always compensate generally with one this grade to start. So let's just say I know your bearing clearances, you know your temperatures, it should run a 530, whatever. If they're running boost and methanol, I'll go up a this grade because they're gonna dilute that oil down so fast, especially in like drag racing, right? Um, so, and then for boost, depending on the level of boost, I might do the same thing. If, if they're not, if they're running, you know, race gas, but they've got a lot of boost, I'll go up a this grade. And you want to do that for like crankshaft flex, get a little extra viscosity in there. So, you know, choosing a viscosity of an oil is like, like I said, really important. You always want to think about the application, what they're doing, are they diluting it, are they not, bearing clearances. I mean, that's why we go all the way up to a straight 70 weight for the nitromethane guys. The tractor pool guys actually flex their crankshaft so much that we have to. You know, and so 
all of that has to be taken into consideration when you choose a this. You know, coming back to it, coyote stock. You guys probably don't deal much with the coyote stock drag guys in the MRA, but it's a sealed class, right? So they're always trying to get every little horsepower they think they can get out of everything. And you catch those guys running really thin oils, trying to get that little bit. And that's what I went back to. You know, always be careful when you go thin because you can lose ring seal and kind of give back what you thought you just got. So going thinner is, you know, something that you can always do as well. But just make sure you know, we're talking about boost, we're talking about methanol, because you go the other way, it could cost you. You know, just, you know, that's the one thing about racing oil that I've learned in the last few years, the applications are so wide. And we deal with so many different kinds of people doing so many different things. We don't like to have just a one size fits all, you know, so. Well, what I've experienced, Bill, is, that, you know, something where you've got, you know, inherently poor windage. Yep. A light, a, you know, like a lighter oil will definitely make some kind of horsepower. But if you've got windage under control and you've got a nice dry sign over the vacuum and yeah. great windage trays, honestly, I, I haven't found an appreciable difference in a couple. Of, a couple I, know, of I haven't either. I mean, Ryan, we ran, we ran what, what we ran, we ran 30 weight in your, maybe stock bottom end stuff. We never, I yeah, the same thing about Corey's is 100 pounds of oil pressure with 5 would be 30 because we don't run any oil temps. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting here looking at the 0 W20 thinking, yeah. This is the move because I mean we've got an external oil pump. We have tight bearing clearances because it's a stock engine, probably 2,000. 2,000, yeah. And you know, 530 is probably overkill for his engine. Yep. He's an external oil pump. Yep. I mean, yeah, think, we'll yeah. right? You think of it this way: if you're too heavy, and, and what happens is, let's just say your oil is too heavy. And let's talk about oil bearing clearance, right? If your oil is too heavy, it's going to drag more. That acts, that heavier oil actually starts to create friction. It starts to create heat. You don't right. want that. Too thin, you don't have any durability, you don't have any production, you're, you know, I guess I'm saying too, too thin, you're actually probably getting some contact, which is giving more drag. You're always trying to find that sweet spot, right, between too thin and too thick. And I just like to get out, you know, I learned this, I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell the story, the first cavity stock race I ever went to, right, I'd worked it driven like three months, okay, formulated my oil my whole life. But I, I didn't ever go to Coyote Stock stuff. I'm not a Ford guy, so whatever. This guy comes up and he goes, hey, I love your oil. Oh, thanks, you know? He goes, yeah, yeah, I'm going to try this new oil today. I'm going to run it, you know, your stuff. And I go, well, what is it? He goes, oh, I don't know. It's in my trailer. He comes back with our zero weight. I mean, that stuff's like water. It's a pro stock oil. And I look right at him and I'm like, do not run that in your motor. He's like, oh, but dude told me, well, on the internet. <laughs> well, I tell you, if I had, I almost did a post, like a video post, to tell everybody, please just stay off the internet. I mean, uh, there was a post on uh, running the 85 in Boost on uh, one of these Facebook groups I'm in, and the answers, there was a hundred answers, and I'm going to tell you that 97 of them were completely off base and wrong. And I wanted to get on there and say, stop asking the internet what you should do. Ask somebody who knows what they're doing what you should do. I mean, I'm sure you guys see that too, right? Hey, what cam should I run in my, please don't do that, you know? Um, but anyway, um, going back to it, I told him, I said, do not run that oil, you know? Well, got to be friends with them, got working with them, and, you know, Coyote motor takes 520, right from the back. I mean, that's what they run. Coyote stock, that's what they run. They were just figuring if they could get something. Well, we finally convinced them we did a bunch of dyno testing. And our 520 made the most power over like the 10 and the, you know, whatever. And why? Well, the crankshaft was happy. You know what I mean? They had ring seal, you know, the BBT, you know, it's all that stuff put together. So it's always nice to stop for a minute and go, all right, so here's where I think my viscosity should be based on all, based on all the mechanical stuff you know. And then start dialing and thinking about, well, how hot is this motor gonna be when it makes a run? Or, or what am I protecting it from? High temp, what am I doing here? Am I boosting it? Am I using methanol? Am I using E85? You know, those are things that are really important to think about before you stick on your vis. And quite frankly, if you got access to a dyno, I don't know, try to find it. Because I've tested a lot of motors with thin oils and thick oils, and 
Yeah, you can see some horsepower pickup, but, you know, are you NASCAR? Where that motor's going to run once, and it's done forever. Or are you a guy that's drag racing for a season, and your motor needs to last? That horsepower or two horsepower you might get might cost you, you know, you got to finish the race to win, guys. I mean, that's, you know, the interesting thing. When I had, my favorite one was a, there's an engine builder that we know, and he does tractor pull. And he runs um, a 70 weight. And a lot of the other guys around him started running a 2050. And I asked him, are you going to do that? And he's like, well, I'm, he said, Bill, why do you think they're doing that? I said, oh, they're thinking, you know, they'll pick up some horsepower. And he goes, he looked at me and he said, so I'm going to go from 3,800 horsepower to 3,803 horsepower. And I went, yeah, okay, I guess this is your point there. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, but the motor that he has has like a six foot long crankshaft that you just don't go by. If something happens to it, you send it to the one guy out there, I guess, that there is, that does those, and he's got it for like eight months. So you always want to look at it from a durability perspective as much as a horsepower perspective and try to find that sweet spot. How do you do it? With a dyno um, and oil analysis. So if somebody comes to me, and oil analysis is something you guys have access to through us. If somebody comes to me, and actually that's kind of what we're doing, I'm kind of doing with some of the driving yard guys, because when I walked into it, I'm like, well, what's the story here, you know? This is totally different. They're pulling a trailer with a pro mod, right? Dragging all day, driving three hours at night. Heck, some of them get stuck in traffic in a pro mod, right? I'm like, what does that do to the oil? Do we really know? So, I didn't switch them to Dream and I didn't do anything. I just started handing out kits. Guys, bring it back. I just wanted to see what I see, which was I started to tell you, I started seeing more and more sharing in that application than I've seen in others, which actually kind of makes sense if you think about it. But, um, you know, power is always something that people in the racing part of this world and racing oils, they're always looking for. And, you know, I started just kind of looking at it and saying, in that application, Sometimes what you're going to get isn't worth what it's going to cost you, right? And I, and I don't know that I should be saying that. Maybe I should be telling, no, just go for it, man. Get the most power. But I don't know that you're doing whoever that is who actually owns that motor any favors at that point. You know? Well, the gains are so minuscule. And, and you're you right. the best. If the crank's happy, if the crank's unhappy, you know, reliability goes to shit, and you probably haven't gained any horsepower anyway. If right. the crank's are unhappy, no, no good comes of not having the right in oil and the right application. It's just like a tune-up on the dyno. Yeah. Nothing good about Three horsepower, you take that degree of timing out. You yeah. take up ten, right. you leave that degree in there. Yeah, right. And that's pretty much it. I mean, that's if we're picking much up it. tens, yeah, that's worthwhile. If you're picking up scraps, then it's not worthwhile. It's not. So what can I do? Because I don't have a dyno, right? And a lot of people we work with every day don't. So we do oil analysis. So basically what I say is don't change the this from what you're doing right now. Give me two oil samples, right? One oil, tell, and one oil sample tells you nothing. You have to have data, right? You have to, and I look at the wear metals. So I take an oil analysis, there's the wear metals. Oil analysis, wear metals. Go to a thinner oil. If the wear metals go up, you better go the other way. If the wear metals look good or better and that's happening, hey, we just optimize your mix. That we just optimize your viscosity. I come back to it. There is no magic rule. There is no, I don't have a crystal ball, right? I don't have a magic wand. But I do have oil analysis. That's the only way if somebody's trying to do something that you can really verify that they're doing the right thing.